Right, welcome to lecture 13. Um, what we're going to talk about today is limit cycles. We're going to be starting in chapter 7, and it is a very exciting um, part of dynamical systems. We've now moving into this century, right? Up until now, the conservative systems, the idea of a potential, was all developed in the 1900s, a lot by Poincaré studying the three body problem. The astronomers got the Roche lobe. There was a lot of understanding that came from there. This property of drawing phase diagrams was also known. And in fact, Poincaré used it in partly when he did that um, diagram that actually gives you the Roche lobe to describe what you see. What developed now, what we're going to look at now, are limit cycles. Um, and this was a phenomenon that only appeared later on. And in fact, it became truly understood when people started developing the radio. OK, so if you think about a radio, you have this radio and you have various frequency bands where you sort of like tune into a particular um, station. And when people were playing with radios and how to do that and sonar and radar during the Second World War and so even during the First World War, that's when a lot of the development in the, thing, in the um, understanding of the circuits took place as well as the mathematical understanding of limit cycles. So it was mathematics and physics and engineering driving themselves together with a common aim and it led to a very deep understanding. So the first thing that I'm going to do is try and get the next slide. Oh, that was a success. Um, is to define what a limit cycle is, okay? If you think of what we've been studying in the one-dimensional systems and in the two-dimensional systems to, to date, we saw that you can have fixed points in the one-dimensional system. We had the theorem that that was the unique thing. Your solution would either ultimately go to the fixed point or it would go to infinity. In two-dimensional systems, we once again saw that we could have fixed points. They could be stable, unstable, or a saddle. Or then we had a new thing. Um, we could have centers, which we could not have in limit cycles, where the oscillation took place on a fixed amplitude with a fixed frequency around a fixed point. Now, this thing, a limit cycle, is something that can happen in two dimensions and higher dimensions. So it's not a one dimension. It doesn't have a one dimensional equivalent. And it is not a center. It can only happen in nonlinear systems. So a definition of a limit cycle is that it is an isolated, closed trajectory, okay? Um, and all the neighboring trajectories are not closed, um, and they spiral either toward or, to way, or away from the limit cycle. Okay, so it's a new topological structure that is possible in the solution space. And so, for example, you can have something like this. This, the dark orbit here is your limit cycle. Anything inside will spiral out to it, and anything from the outside can spiral in and approach it. Here, typically inside, you have an unstable fixed point, and outside, you eventually have that the thing basically decreases. And so this is something we've not seen before. It has a lot of application in engineering. In fact, people design systems to have limit cycles like that. Another example of a limit cycle is something like this. Okay, this, is, this one's called a stable limit cycle. This one is called an unstable limit cycle. So you basically have this trajectory, and these you seldom see. Um, the spiral starts on the trajectory and then can spiral into a fixed point in the middle, or it can start near the trajectory and spiral out. So you can see in some sense it's a generalization of a fixed point. Right, the sim, many, it has many of the same properties, all except it's now in two dimensions and it's completely um, closed. It's a closed orbit, so it's a new thing. Just remember that the thing that dictates what is possible is that uni uh, existence and uniqueness theorems, in which in two dimensions basically means that your trajectories cannot cross, although they can come together at a fixed point. Right, so you can never draw a phase diagram, and when your trajectories cross. And so you can see the possibilities of the limit cycle exist because the trajectories basically don't cross. And finally, there's the equivalent of sort of a metastable fixed point or a half-stable limit cycle, which is now the generalization. It's simply 
a limit cycle where you approach it from the one side, okay, so from the outside you spiral into the limit cycle, however if you perturb off of it you eventually go to a, um, a, um, a fixed point over there. Typically your half stable limit cycles also occur at bifurcation points, okay. So there's a lot that whatever you did for fixed points in 1D, we are eventually going to do for limit cycles in 2D. Okay, so it's an additional sort of structure where your solutions can go to. Right, a limit cycle, if, it is, is a, um, is, if it's stable, has many physical models that it corresponds to, and um, it's also found a lot in biological space. You have these tremendous chemical experiments where if you stir them, they take one color, they make a vortex, and they spin, and then they turn to another color, and then they come back. That's a, limit, a mathematical limit cycle. There are these bacterial molds where you see all the colors, and they change, and they cycle. That's also another example of a limit cycle. Um, and so it's basically, it appears in, it models physical and biological systems, that spontaneously drift into periodic oscillation. Another very famous limit cycle is your heartbeat, right? That's a limit cycle. It's stable for a whole bunch of parameters, right? Your heart tends to beat roughly in a rhythm, regardless of when you're exercising or whether you're sleeping. You can do a lot of things to your body, and your heart will still remain beating, which is a godly gift because <laughs> you have a wide region of parameters that will render your limit cycle stable. When your limit cycle goes unstable, you have that fibrillation and you're basically having a heart attack. It means you've pushed your heart into a regime where it can no longer reach its limit cycle that sustains the life, that pumps at the right rhythm so that the blood can throw you, flow into your lungs and through your vessels in an effective way. In fact, your fibrillation, a lot of research that Strogatch actually worked on with a student is that part of your heart dies and then if, that, if a small amount ha dies, nothing happens. So it's just this wave, it ignores it, it keeps on beating. But if a large enough part ha dies, then it actually affects the way the muscles contract. And then your heart runs a risk of fibrillating. And the question is, what do you then do to your heart? Can you cut out this part that's dead in a way that the heart will again beat systematically? And they studied this. And they were said a, few, a lot of things was actually... Uh, discovered that changed the treatment of how you go about fixing a heart attack. Um, so, okay, so limit cycle models f uh, stable and was it phys physical and biological systems that spontaneously drift um, into a period of oscillation from a large range of initial conditions. And so we have the heartbeat, body temperature is another one. Your body temperature tends to fluctuate with a um, daily. And there's certain things that regulate your sleep-wake cycle, how you feel in the morning, um, how your body responds, what it does at certain times of the day. And that's also a limit cycle. Um, another example is your hormone rhythms, right? Women have um, cycles different from men, monthly cycles, that, men, that are less prominent in men, which, but also slightly there. And that's regulated by hormones that also have this property that they hit this very stable limit cycle that's repeated. And if your hormones go out of sync, then you actually also have very serious problems, as what happens in old age often. Okay. Another famous example is feedback control systems in engineering. Um, one beautiful example that I actually wanted to get you a picture of is, you know we did the, the unstable the pendulum in the last class, and it was very hazardous for my arm, but we had this one fixed point. The one fixed point is where the pendulum dangles and approaches at the bottom here. The other fixed point is up here. Um, can you think of any use for this fixed point? Uncertainty. Huh? Uncertainty. I didn't think there was one, to tell you the truth. Um, and... Then I was at university and I saw these people riding on segways. Do you know what a segway is? It's a little machine that consists of two wheels, roughly this size. They're like this big and this far apart. And then you have a little platform 
over here between the two wheels and somebody stands on it and then you have a handle that goes up and you have handlebars. Okay. And then you, if you push the thing forward, it runs forward. If you hold it back, it stops. Okay. And you can stand on it and they can go as fast as about 30 k's an hour. They're not allowed to, but they can. And so I became curious because it looks weird. It looks like the thing continuously wants to fall over. So I went and looked actually at the manual of how they designed it because one of the people that designed it um, was sort of there and people were talking about it. And so the way it works, the mathematics behind it, so I think it's Segway, And it's caused a lot of problems in Europe because people don't know how to classify it as a bicycle or a car or, a, you know, the regulators can't cope. Anyway, so, so the way it works is it's basically the mathematics that drives it. It's basically a pendulum that is un it's an unstable fixed point. And then there's another class in mathematics that you typically do by, it's a subsection of engineering. Um, you typically do it after, after you've done a course in dynamical system. It's called feedback control. So what happens is, what feedback control comes from is you have a dynamical system, you have certain parameters in it. And the, uh, the whole problem of feedback control is how do you change those parameters, excuse me, in a way to tweak the engineering system in the, op the dynamical system in an optimal way. So it's the same kind of idea as what we got with the budworms where you could change like the number of predators you brought in to stop it from going to outbreak. The same thing is true of, of systems engineering where you sort of have the system and then you have a whole bunch of knobs and the feedback control is how do you change that dynamically in a way that the system responds in a way you want it to respond. So what a pendulum is, is basically a feedback control system of an inverted pendulum where they've got a whole bunch of really, really strong motors over here. And the whole system, the mathematics is basically designed to continuously stop the pendulum from falling over and yet to give you a chance to maneuver it backwards and forward and speed it up and slow it down. Um, it's really an interesting uh, study of sort of how it works. Anyway, so in those systems, you also tend to want limit cycles where you have a large range of parameters where the thing remains stable. In other words, you have a large range of parameters where your segue obviously doesn't fall over and do really odd things and hurt whoever's on it. Okay, radio oscillators, and this is how it began, right? The, the problem of tuning a radio into a certain frequency that you could, trans, um, you could transport information on that frequency and still keep the radio stable around that frequency was basically what started a lot of the mathematics of this field. And a very famous example is the Van der Poel oscillator that they actually managed to like um, fix it or sort of understand it completely. Um, another one is chemical oscillators that I've mentioned, um, mechanical vibrations. And this is a fun part of the class. Mechanical vibrations that go into limit cycles are typically a problem. Um, there's a thing called flutter that actually makes, um, that was m the major cause of death in the First World War. So what happens is the aircrafts were designed in a certain, for certain air conditions, um, but if they went too fast, their wings literally started flapping like birds. So the birds used it to stay in the air, but it, it breaks, the aircraft couldn't take it. Um, and it basically vibrated till the aircraft fall, fell apart. And it's still a problem, especially now when people are designing um, very light aircraft, like if solar planes or planes that, that, can, that, don't, flow, that don't fly on fuel. Um, when they design those, um, flutter is again a problem. So it's very, it's hard to, you basically have to design it so that you don't have these limit cycles that cause flutter. Okay. Another example is bridges. Um, when air flows over bridges, it also causes oscillation. And these typically also go to limit cycles and they're also called flutter. And some of the most, the biggest bridge disasters in the world was actually caused by wind. The famous one that we'll actually look at is called the Galloping Gertie. Um, they literally had tons and tons of concrete doing this and eventually pulled itself apart. 
So in engineering, understanding what limit cycles are and what their properties are are very, very important. In fact, when you design mechanical systems, you try and avoid it at all costs. When you're designing heart therapy, you try and retain it at all costs. So it can be both good and bad. Okay. So that's a basically introduction. This, as I said, this is where I start liking it very much. The rest is solid foundation, what you'll need for your first test. Go through it carefully. But the applications become more and more interesting the moment we start studying limit cycles. Okay, so I just want to give you an example, a first example that's easy to calculate of how you would see a limit cycle in two-dimensional space. So this example, I basically... You construct it in polar coordinates. So this is the polar radius. So you have x dot equals to 1 times 1 minus r squared. And you're going to have a theta dot equals to omega. So theta dot you can solve instantaneously. It's simply theta is equals to omega t plus a constant. So you literally have in your x, y plane, you have a point that you know is going around with a constant velocity or angular velocity and how far its radius is determined by the, this dynamical system. And so we assume that r is greater than or equals to zero. The constant angular frequency we have over here means that we can immediately solve this differential equation, which means that your solution is just rotating counterclockwise with a constant frequency. The radial motion is one-dimensional. Um, and so we can analyze it in our normal one-dimensional way. We basically have the graphs positive, the graphs negative. You have an unstable fixed point at zero, and you have a stable fixed point at one. Okay? And so what's going to happen is that the solution approaches r equals to one with a long period of time. And if you then go... Um, and if then you go and plot what the solution actually looks like in terms of the x and the y plane, right, your x and y coordinates, you get something that looks like that. Okay, so this differential equation, I could have started out and written it in x and y, and it would have looked really ugly, and I could have said, seek the solution. But what I've done instead is I gave it in polar coordinates because it was constructed that way to make it an easy example. And I just want to show you that such physical solutions are actually possible. And so here you can see it, how it actually looks in x, y space. Remember, wherever you are, theta is always going to be going counterclockwise like this around. It's going to make a circle around the origin. And if r is greater than zero, it's going to decrease until r reaches zero, reaches one. So if r is greater than one, it's going to decrease till r reaches one. And then it's going to approach this limit cycle. Right? So all these things come in from outside. See, their theta is increasing. If you're in the center, you have an unstable spiral, right? Theta tends to increase, and r get, also increases until you reach one. And so you have it. And so this dark line is the example of the limit cycle. It contains all our assumptions, right? It is an isolated orbit. There's nothing else close to it. And all orbits basically are attracted to it. Okay, so it's a stable limit cycle at r equals to 1. And just one more thing. If you were to actually plot what the graph would be, in other words, what the x position would be, as a function of time, if you were, for example, starting over here, what you would see is that the x position would basically decrease, or you're starting out here, I think. So your x position would basically decrease to zero. No? What have I done wrong? X. The x position will decrease. Yeah, okay, sorry. I'm looking at it wrong. You should, uh, the x position should actually decrease. So you start out here, the x position decreases till you reach that point over there. So x is equal to zero. It goes negative until it reaches the maximum negative value, which is over there, which is one, right? So we're at that point now. And then it's over here. At the negative x value, it then increases again until it reaches zero, which corresponds to, to this point, 
and then it actually continues to increase until it reaches one over there, and after that, it just remains um, locked into this periodic orbit. So you can see in some sense why it's a tuning mechanism, right? Regardless of where you start in your phase space, you're eventually going to end up oscillating around the circle with a fixed frequency omega. Okay, and that actually, when you start engineering systems, has a huge application. In fact, your radio tuning has basically got a circuit with several limit cycles in that permits you to tune it to the various radio, um, to your various radio stations, and then you just change the amplitude to actually give the, um, the, the signal coming, uh, or the actual inf input or the voice is modulated by a very rapid frequency that you tune to, and then you just watch the changes in amplitude as it goes back and returns to the frequency. Right. Another example, the main thing I want to say at this point, this is an example where it's round. Limit cycles don't have to be round. Okay, they can be any periodic orbit, so it doesn't have to necessarily have a circular shape. Another example is the van der Poel oscillator. So I'm just going to give you an introduction to it, but we're going to study it in greater detail um, in what comes. It's the one that you, is used to describe nonlinear electric circuits um, uh, in the first radios. And what it looks like is something like this. Okay? So now we're no longer conveniently constructing it in polar coordinates. This was something people played with the circuits. They wrote down the potential equations for a circuit then they found that you got this type of property, and this was then eventually generalized to all types of circuits that would give you the property of being able to tune it. Um, and so what a typical circuit that you can tune is something like this. You have a force that looks at, like acceleration force, you know, x double dot is equals to x, which is a harmonic oscillator. The part that's in front of x dot is basically a nonlinear damping term. But unlike a linear damping term, which has always got a certain sign in mu, this skin can be positive and negative, because if x is less than 1, this term is, the blue term is negative. If it's x greater than 1, the blue term is positive. So that was a typical thing. You had a nonlinear damping term that could take on both signs. Okay, so mu is assumed greater than 0, like all, any damping parameter. And the term in brackets is the nonlinear damping term. And that's the minimum amount of complexity you need to actually make a limit cycle for these type of circuits. Okay, so if x is greater than 1, you have... Sorry, if x is less than 1, so in other words... No, if x is greater than 1, you have ordinary damping. In other words, energy gets sucked out. If x is less than 1, you get energy pumped in. Okay, so if you do the linear analysis of the circuit... The, it also has a fixed point at zero, zero, but it's an unstable fixed point. And so what basically happens is you pump energy in for small values of x until the thing goes unstable, and for large values of x you suck energy out, and so it's almost logical that in between there's a limit cycle, and we'll be studying ways of proving that in various regimes. Okay. So this system, I'm just going to give you the results for now, but we'll, look, we'll derive it in greater detail. It has a stable limit cycle, and it's been rigorously shown that it's a stable limit cycle for all mu greater than zero. Okay? You can also prove that the limit cycle is unique. In other words, there's only one, and we'll do that proof as well in what comes. And just to give you an idea of what the limit cycle looks like, this is if mu is big. Right, so the great thing about this van der Poel oscillator, it's going to allow us to introduce a whole bunch of other techniques for analyzing limit cycles. And so I'm just going to give you the ideas of what's possible today, and then we'll start looking at um, the exact examples in the next lecture. So in other words, this one you basically have this basically, well, I'm going to call it duck-shaped, you know, like those ducks that you get to play with in the bath. It's this duck-shaped purple curve. So if you're here inside, what you're basically going to do is you're going to go like this, you're going to approach this limit cycle over here, and then you're basically going to stick on this very, very oddly shaped curve.
curve over there, and you're just going to keep going round. If you start for large x, um, and x or x dot, you're going to start here at the blue, you're going to come in, you're going to do that, and then you're going to hit the limit cycle, and you're just going to stay there. Okay, so not all limit cycles are round, not all limit cycles have very nice sine curves, but the one thing that they, the one property that identifies them is one, they closed, they're orbits, in other words, there's no fixed points on your limit cycle, and they have a large, if they're stable, they have a large region of things that attract them. So just to give you an idea of what the waveform or what it will look like for the blue and the purple curves as a function of time, you can see here the blue curve starts at x minus 2, so over there, and then it basically, you simply can follow what it does. It basically increases quite rapidly until it reaches its maximum value over there at 2, and then it basically, um, sorry, it increases quite rapidly until it reaches its maximum value of 2 over there. Um, then it actually hits the limit cycle, and it decreases slowly, and then it decreases more rapidly to its biggest negative value over there, and then goes, keeps on oscillating as it goes around this limit cycle. The purple curve over here started at an x value of roughly zero. It then increases to a little bit less than the blue, hits the limit cycle over there, and then continues exactly on the limit cycle, and you can see the two are exactly the same waveform, just displaced. Okay, so that's simply to give you an idea of the generality of what the limit cycle can actually describe, and to give you a brief introduction of the van der Poel oscillator. So now you're faced with a problem, you're just given the differential equations. How do you determine if you actually have a limit cycle or not? Okay, and what we're going to do first is look at a whole bunch of systems where you can prove that you don't have one. Okay, so I'm going to give you all the major results there. Um, and these, some of the checks are really easy to carry out. And so it's often better, less expensive to check whether or not you have a limit cycle than to try and put in the whole machinery you need to prove that you can actually, or to try and actually get out the limit cycle again. So the first type of system that ha definitely does not have a limit cycle in it is something we call a gradient system. And so these guys, these sort of systems that don't have limit cycles all have a similar type of idea, um, and they, get, they include more and more things as we go on. So a gradient system is a system that simply obeys that x dot is equals to minus the gradient of a potential function. Okay, and v of x is a single-valued function. And then there's a theorem, and we'll prove it, that basically says closed orbits are impossible um, in gradient systems. Okay, and the method of proof is useful because it's going to be generalized soon. Um, it's a proof by contradiction. So the first thing is, let us suppose there exists a closed orbit. And then we get, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the change in V after one circuit of the orbit, right? So V is a single-valued scalar function. You can view it as a cone or so, anything that you specify. And so if there's a closed orbit, it's basically going to go around the contour of V, and we want to compute the change after one circuit, and so, in other words, after one circuit, there's a certain period of time, namely t equals to the period of the circuit. And at that time, because it's a closed orbit, the change in v is equals to vx of t, in other words, at the end, minus vx where it started. And we know that's got to be zero because it's a closed orbit. It's basically gone around and got back to where it started. Okay, and that also follows from the fact that V is a scalar function, right? It's only a function of position. And because it's the same position, it should be zero. Okay, so basically it's true because you're back to where you started, and V is single valued. So those are the two conditions, and it's true. So what we're now going to do is, instead of viewing the answer this way, we're going to say, 
Let us add together all the infinitesimal changes in V and try and see what, what, thing, what the result is of that thing. In other words, we're going to say we want to basically integrate from 0 to t around the orbit of what dv dt times d dt is. Okay? dv dt is simply the gradient of v dotted in with x dot. Okay? But x dot is, by definition of your gradient system, just minus the gradient of v squared. Okay? Or you could do what I seem to have done, is replace the gradient of v with minus x dot. So we basically have something equals to minus the integral of a thing that's squared, okay, which is simply minus the integral of the norm squared of x. This thing is positive, and integrating the positive thing, the thing over a positive, um, a sort of from 0 to t, uh, integrating a positive number, you will always result that because the minus sign is in front, it's less than 0. So we have two things that should be the same, the basically the macroscopic change of V that we know to be zero, as well as the infinitesimal changes that we should we add together, which is less than zero, so we have a contradiction because they should be equal, and this basically means that our initial assumption that there exists a closed orbit is wrong. Okay? So gradient systems cannot have a closed orbit in in fact, what happens with gradient systems is they tend to simply run down the potential to all the minima in the potential, and those are the fixed points. Yes? In the underpower oscillator, the differential equation for the underpower oscillator, do we find, is there a conserved quantity? No. No. Um, it's a good question. It's very hard. Remember, uh, so it, it actually is a very deep question. Um, it's very hard to determine whether you have a conserved quantity or not. I never, never gave you those rules of how to get it, so. Um, generally, it's hard to test whether you have a conserved quantity as well. Um, the only thing that we had, one of the properties of conserved quantities was, remember what we knew about the nature of the fixed point. We had a theorem that proved that your fixed points can either be circles or centers, nonlinear centers, or they can be saddles. And in the van der Poel oscillator, in the middle of that limit cycle, you have an unstable fixed point. Okay, so that's an unstable spiral, so it can never be a conservative system. Okay, so that's the proof that you can never have a conservative system. But then you have to know, or you have to basically do the linear analysis of your van der Poel oscillator, see that the fixed point in the center is unstable, an unstable spiral, and that would be enough to say you can never get a conservative system because we have that other theorem that the only, f on the only nature of fixed points of a conservative system are centers and saddles. Okay. So first, the, first, the first problem with this thing, this is a very nice result, but there are very few ordinary differential equations that um, are gradient systems, right? Just as there are very few different ODEs that are actually have another conservative quantity, this is also true of gradient systems, and so we're going to want a better proof to check. So this is one small check you can carry out. If you immediately recognize that x dot is equals to a gradient system, then you're done. Then you have no fixed points. How would you check whether x dot is a gradient system? What do you know about a gradient? Right, suppose I give you x dot equals to some function of x and y, and y dot is equal to g of x and y. How would you check whether you have a gradient system? I don't even know if Strogatz says that. There's a quick way to check if a, if a vector field is a gradient. Um, what do you know about the curl of a gradient? Huh? Curl of a gradient is always zero. Okay, so there's a way, if you're actually given a system, you work out the curl of that system. If it's zero, it's a gradient system, and you can immediately say that there are no closed orbits in it. 
Okay, so you basically have to work out, suppose you have um, x dot is equals to f of x and y, um, a y dot is equals to g of x and y, then you've basically got to work out the gradi the cool of basically f and g. In other words, um, df dy minus dg dx. And if that vanishes, then you have a gradient system and you know it's zero. So you don't have to guess anything with a theorem, which is what makes it powerful. Yes? Yeah, just work out the curl of these two and if it's zero. Okay, because this is always true, right? If you have the gradient of the curl of the gradient of V, okay, that's equal to zero. And so if F and G are actually the gradient of V, then this thing will also be zero, and that's enough to say that it is a gradient. Okay, so, so the basic idea, as I've said, with a gradient system is you've got this potential. What this thing tells you is that your, your um, trajectories are basically going to flow down to the minimum um, of your potential. Okay, I'm going to stop there because it's going to take me longer than I need to actually finish the next discussion. Okay, so what we're going to do in the next lecture is basically generalize this idea of potential functions because there are more functions than just ordinary potential functions that, are, um, that don't admit limit cycles. And we prefer to exclude all the possible differential equations in an easy manner before we actually start studying the limit cycles. So I'll do that next and then go on to theorems that actually govern when we can prove that we have a limit cycle as well. But that will happen after your tests. Any questions at this point? <laughs>